scoot up for a second and let's talk. Yo, DJ, roll that beautiful champagne footage. Champagne gang, fierce fam, confidant. Welcome to another episode of The X-Files Exposed, where love stories become X-Files. Now, we're not going to do a whole lot of talking in the beginning of this one because, baby, this one is a doozy. <laughs> and not only is it a doozy, it's a long one. It's about 26 chapters, 8 to 10 minutes each. So this is going to be broken up into two parts. The first part is going to be the first 10 episodes, and then we'll conclude it in another video. But what I want you all to do is every time you hear something that you think is a red flag, I need you to drop a red flag in the comments. Let's see how many red flags you point out in this story. Join us in the chat because we're going to be chatting about it. <laughs> so if you're ready, make sure you have your glasses filled to the rim. Make sure you're comfortable and let's get ready to get into it. But first, take those glasses and raise them in the air. You know it's time for our boost of empowerment. And today, we're talking about knowing your worth. You ready? Knowing your worth is the foundation of your strength. It's the inner compass that guides your choices, the shield that protects your peace, and the fire that ignites your ambition. When the world would try to undervalue you, stand firm in the truth of who you are. Your your worth is not up for negotiation. It's a non-negotiable fact. Repeat after me. I am priceless, powerful, and deserving of all the greatness life has to offer. Here's to you, confidant, for you are worth it. Let's toast. So the title of this is How I Met, Married, and Got Scammed by a Gold Digger. Let's get ready to get into it. And stay tuned at the end where I give you an excerpt from my other channel, Inky Noir Champagne Mystery, for all of my murder mystery enthusiasts. Y'all ready? Let's get into it. This is the beginning of a series called How I Met, Married, and Got Scammed by a Gold Digger. And I'm going to follow some of Reese's Tisa's Wait, style in the sense I'm going to publish this as fast as possible and tell you as much details. I'm going to be incredibly honest and it will be emotional because this is was a very traumatic experience for me. Was I was terrified a lot in this relationship. But I also want to start out f first with some disclaimers and also a little bit of introduction. I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, as you heard me correctly. I have a PhD and I'm a psychologist, or at least I was at the time. I was uh, just had wrapped up my private practice and I had been practicing and seeing clients for over 20 years. I had been widowed and had started dating pretty pretty seriously when I met and this person that I'm going to describe. I'm using fake names uh, except for my own name and uh, some detail the, the details of the particulars like where we were or what we were doing all of that's real all of that can be documented. I have text messages, emails, uh, photos, all sorts of uh, even legal certificates to prove that what I'm telling you is the truth. Um, but I'm going to hide this person's identity for obvious reasons. I'm also want to let you know that you're going to see that there are tons of red flags, like red flag glower. In fact, I think this is more like a bullfight in which I was the bull and thought I was to run after the red flags. But there are some reasons for that, too, and I will get into that in one of the early parts. I'll stop and kind of backtrack and tell you a little bit more of my history and why I was missed what I what was right in front of me, how I could have been so got, gullible, you know, naive and gullible. I also want to say that um, this is really vulnerable. I am actually feel pretty terrified telling you this because it does not reflect well on me. I... I have I made a grave error and and I I fell in love with the wrong person and thought that I'd met an amazing person. I thought I'd met my soulmate as much as I didn't believe in it. I thought when I met this guy that I it, that's who he was and so I really fell head over heels with this person. And and then I had learned, you know, a lot of accommodating style that I had 
you know, growing up in a, a home where you were to obey, it was a, a, a very strict religious authoritarian environment. And so I had learned to do what I was told. And I, I, I had believed that people were basically good and that, and well-meaning and, and that, that to question the assumption of something was to be insulting and it was to be nagging and disrespectful. And as a woman, we get a lot of messages not to do that. I didn't want to be the B word. So there were a lot of times where I acquiesced and thought that that would be showing respect and humility and that, that I would be rewarded for that. But I learned all that did was make me a better and bigger victim. Um, I also want to let you know that periodically I will stop and tell you more details about what was going on behind the scene, what was going on in my own head, what I was thinking about. I'm going to give you a psychological perspective because I think that's the fascinating part. A lot of what I know today, I didn't know at that time. I, I was, I really took it as face value. But since then, I have done a super deep dive into narcissistic abuse, into narcissism, into psychopathy, and and just predatory behavior as a whole. And I even can give you some references. If you're finding yourself struggling in one of these relationships and you don't know what's real and you're really struggling to figure out who it is that you're married to and what you should do next or who you're in a relationship with and what you should do next, you know, I'd be happy to give you some recommendations, books like Why Does He Do That by Lundy Bancroft. Also, How Does He Get her, Into Her Head by Don Hennessy. Uh, Women Who Love Psychopaths by Sandra Brown. There's a whole host of excellent material out there that describes predatory behavior. And that's what happened to me. I met a very sophisticated predator. We often think that that good boundaries can protect us. They can't. When you meet someone skilled enough who understands the manipulation and understands black uh, um, brainwashing techniques you're meeting someone who really knows how to get into your psyche and, and is playing with your psychological fears and needs so that you end up being conditioned to accept a whole lot of things that you normally wouldn't have. And that's what happened to me. I, I was completely blindsided by this person. I, I didn't anticipate that I was meeting someone that was highly deceptive and ex extremely exploitative. So those are some disclaimers and premises that I want to set up the series with. Um, I will try my best to answer comments. I also know I, I'm feeling really exposed, honestly, really exposed. I know a lot of you are going to think that I was super stupid and made a lot of very dumb errors. And looking back, yeah, I when I got out of that relationship, I felt so much profound shame, so much profound shame. And it cost me not only my dignity, but it also cost me a whole lot of money. But maybe by you hearing my story, you'll know a few things. One is you're not alone. This can happen to even somebody with a PhD in psychology that, that, that there is a level of extreme dangerousness to predatory behavior, that there are people who are so good at this, who are so instinctual, so practiced, that they're able to get past even those of us that think that we see this. You know, how did people like Bernie Madoff pull off what he did? How did Jeff Epstein uh, go as far as he did for long as he did exploiting and taking advantage of people? Unfortunately, it makes us edgy and uncomfortable to know that victimization is something that we all are vulnerable to at any point, at any time, with a, a lot of money, possibly with anybody. You know, I, I remember reading Ann Rule's book about Ted Bundy, and he, she actually worked alongside of him at the suicide hotline and then to discover that he was a serial killer and did all these horrific things. And, you know, here she she thought he was a really good guy, but here and worked next to him. So sometimes it that the person beside you who seems really good may be super dangerous. So I'm going to get into my story called How I Met, Married and Got Scammed by a Gold Digger. And let's buckle up and do this together. So I met Caesar on a dating app called Elite Singles. I had been on a few dating apps at that time. I think Plenty of Fish was one, Match. 
and I'd been dating about a year. I probably met about 50 to 60 guys for what I called one and done dates, where you show up and you meet these people and and then you find out that, you know, maybe you're looking for different things or they have a kind of lifestyle that's not compatible to you or just something that's just a non-negotiable. So I had I had met quite a few men and just realized how hard it was, how how unique it was going to find somebody to match my life as a person who was in her early 50s with kids leaving home and you know with a with a pretty quiet lifestyle at that point and i'm going to get into a little bit more of my background about what had happened and led up to me being single at that point and why i was looking for a new partner so i was on elite single and it was expensive and it was about to renew and i went to cancel it and realized i had missed the subscription date by one date and i appealed to the company and asked for them to reimburse me for the subscription fee and they said no we're not going to so then I got a little more serious and started looking at people and a profile passed my you know they like showed so many profiles and one of the profiles that passed my for preview was a highly attractive man he was five years younger than me uh, showed him on top of the Sears Tower uh, in the backdrop of Chicago making me think he lived in Chicago and and uh and he just super good look. He looked like he was a model from GQ on a cover of GQ. And my first depression was cuz I've always considered myself kind of an average looking person was nah, he's just too handsome. So I I passed on by. But the next day I noticed that he had looked at my profile and so I looked at his again. And then I thought, you know what, what, why, what do I have to lose? So I said, hey, it looks like we have a few things to in common. Would you be interested to see if we had more in common? And he wrote back, said, sure. Now, I want to tell you something else about this profile that was kind of unique. That at the time I thought, I kind of chuckled, but today I would have, I would have swiped left. And that was at the bottom of the profile. He said he had some deal breakers. He didn't want to meet anybody who had tattoos a piercings outside your ear earrings was a liberal, an atheist, or a pet owner. Now, none of those applied to me, but I didn't really like see. I mean, yeah, I thought that was a little arrogant of him to be so specific, but a lot of people have preferences, and I just thought, well, at least he's being clear. And since I didn't have any of those issues, I thought, okay, why not? So I responded. So he said, sure. So we start chatting. And we texted probably, and this was, by the way, in July of 2016 when I first met him. And we start texting back and forth for a few weeks, and it seemed really good. And I said, do you think we should meet? Now, granted, I thought he was living outside of Chicago because the name of his town was sort of like one of those areas. And he said, no. He said he was actually in Minnesota nine hours away. And I like, no, this is a deal breaker. I'm not going to deal with long distance. But he said, wait, 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 it's only an, air, an hour by air. And I have no problem flying in. And at first I'm thinking, I hope he's not thinking he's going to stay with me because that's not happening. He said, I'll just run a, 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 a hotel and come in for the day. I'll come in on Saturday and then I'll leave on Sunday and we can spend Saturday together and see if there's any connection. I thought, okay, sure, why not? So we plan this for like a week or two ahead. And then the day comes down and, and I go to the airport to pick him up and you know, he, he looked like his photos and he seemed like a decent guy. He was loud. That's one thing that hit me the first off was that he was like larger than life and he really filled the car space. Um, we headed out to Lake Michigan. I was living in, in Michigan at the time. Lake Michigan for the day where I, I had planned to have a, a, a lunch and, and just to sort of sit and, and look at the beautiful water and get to know each other in this August. By then, this, this is August with each other. So we get there and the first thing I notice is that he's a little like chivalrous to extreme, you know, and at first I'm thinking, well, that's really nice. Like he took all the beach stuff and it literally like loaded him down and I'm trying to help and he's swinging it away and saying, no, no, he's got this. He's come to take care of me. And I thought, so sweet. So we get there and we're having a good time. We're enjoying a wine cooler and looking at the water. And then I realized that I forgot the meat, all the cold supplies are still in the refrigerator back home that we just have all the makings for sandwiches, but nothing to really make the sandwich. And he's super cool. He said, no, no, no worries. I got it. We'll be fine. And uh, so we make the best of what we have with some fruits and, and some chips. Um, but then we kind of wrap it up early and he goes, let me take you out. We, maybe you can see a movie. And I'm thinking, yeah, we've had a really good time. He seems, what hit me about that was 
he seemed to check all the boxes. And I'd had a list of requirements that I was looking for in a person. You know, I wanted them to have a career. He, he had a professional job. His kids were roughly the same age as mine. They were also leaving the house. Um, it just, it was shocked me how much we just lined up. He went to similar churches I did. He seemed to have similar faith as that I, as I did. Just seemed like a really nice professional man. Um, I knew he was Hispanic and, and, uh, that he had actually, um, immigrated here. Anybody had been here for a very long time for all of his adult life, basically. And I just, there was a lot about him that felt safe, really nice and safe. And I, and all the dating I had done, I had not met anybody that had aligned so much with what I was looking for. But then there ended up being a caveat. He hadn't really shared a whole lot about his history or about his, his relationship history, particularly. And I knew he was like in his late forties and he shared he'd been married four times. And that was like shocking. I wanted to drop my mouth. And then he went through each one real quickly. Like what kind of went wrong? You know, he said he was really young the first time and he didn't really love her. He just wanted out of the house. And the second one he'd been with for a long time, but it was a rough marriage and they had a child together. Actually, he had a child with the first wife too, but he had a child with the second one. And then the third marriage was really short. And he said that, you know, she kind of prioritized other relationships outside of him. The fourth marriage, he said that he discovered she had a legal history and that uh, she was kind of dangerous and didn't feel safe with her and that he was learned his lesson and was really trying to approach relationships differently. And then he gave me a gift. He gave me a book called Love and Respect written by a Christian author. And he said, I really started realizing that I need to model relationships after this. And that one of the things that I had done previously is I rushed too fast and I didn't really interview the person to make sure that we're a match. So I'm looking for someone who's better match. And I'm thinking all of this sounds great. It sounds like this is a thoughtful person who really has considered what it is that he's looking for. And it made me feel better. And I thought it was really cool that he brought a book and he said it was his, that he had underlined the key pieces and parts that meant a lot to him and touched him. And I really felt like that was an incredible gift, you know, but I want you to put a pin on that one. And I'm going to come back later in the story about that book. So we, as we're wrapping up, I decided to ask him one of my deal breakers. And one of mine is that I have a thing about pornography. I have a history of SA and I had been uh, exposed to it in a really weird way. And it really bothers me. And it wasn't part of my first marriage. And I just didn't want that to be a big part of our second marriage. So I asked him and he looked, he got, he acted weird. He said, no. And it, like, this was like an off, off, not allowed subject, like off limits. And I, I thought that was really strange, but I thought, okay, you know, maybe, I don't know. I just thought it was strange, but we ended up with the rest of the day. It went great. Um, that night I was really wiped and went home. And after I dropped him off at the hotel and, uh, and just, I, I, but I was kind of conflicted about the history of his marriages. I didn't know quite what that meant. And, and if that was a good, I, I feel, I was feeling like a little overwhelmed, you know, that I would be the fifth potentially serious relationship if this went somewhere. So the next morning I go back to the hotel to take him to the airport and he invites me up into his room, which I didn't want to go. I, I felt really uncomfortable. We were supposed to go to church, but I didn't feel good enough to go to church. So he said, as he's packing up, just come up and wait with me. I'm almost done packing. And then when we're there, he said a couple odd things. One was he said that he was surprised he wanted me so much. And that hurt, but I kind of decided to overlook it. And he started kissing me and, you know, pushing up against me. And I felt suffocated, like I couldn't breathe. But I had gotten into a place with myself where I really wanted a relationship and I I, I was mad at God. I had a faith, but I was really angry with God. And even though I was a person who didn't believe in, you know, intimacy before marriage, I had decided that if the opportunity arose that I might take advantage of that. I just was really conflicted, but I felt kind of suffocated by him. And he pushed me to be intimate with him really fast. And, and that was weird because he just, when it was over, he just got up and kind of packed and got ready to leave the room. But I felt sort of odd, funny and uncomfortable about what happened. And the other really weird thing he said that I didn't know what it meant was that when we did this on the date on the beach, he said he'd been looking for widows. And I didn't really know what that meant. I thought maybe he saw that I was a widow and he started researching it. So it, again, I just didn't know what it meant of it. But that's the end of part one of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. This is part three of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. And I want to back up and give you some details about 
my life prior to meeting Caesar. I had met my lifelong partner, Brad, back when I was 19 years old. And when I met him, I fell madly in love with him and we became inseparable. And we were married two years later and were together for 31 years. We had three kids, three sons, and um, we were moving into our early 50s and planning to retire, thinking that at 60 we'd retire. And we were already kind of envisioning the life that we wanted to have. In fact, we had also bought a property. We were going to build a new kind of retirement home and had been working with an architect and um, I was excited. I was excited about things where things were heading. We had been single for seven years before we had our first child and while I was going through grad school, and he helped me with that. And it was probably one of the best parts of our marriage, that single period. So I was looking forward to being retired with him with our last child gone and really kind of re rekindling the love that we had, the connection we had, because we'd been so busy raising kids and getting on with our career. And I was really looking forward to us shifting. Well, in December of 2014, he started vomiting and weird. It was weird. I saw one of the incidences. He actually turned gray. I didn't know the body could turn gray and it got super cold and then he fell asleep. He got super sleepy and then he, sorry, it makes me really emotional thinking about this. He would fall asleep and then when he'd wake up, the, the nausea had disappeared and he'd feel better. But I knew this was wrong. Something was essentially really wrong. So I urged him to see the doctor. He kept saying, no, it's my diet. I've been eating gluten. I shouldn't, or I've been, you know, doing something, you know, cheating in things and I shouldn't be eating, maybe having milk or whatever. And I kept thinking, no, this is not normal. This is not normal. So after a really bad incident where we went to a Christmas party that year, he got super sick. We ended up in the ER and they, again, they didn't find anything. And I was feeling panicked because I could tell something was really, really wrong. So a friend of ours got us into an ENT the day after Christmas, which I just thought was miraculous. And because we couldn't, we couldn't get in. We couldn't get an appointment with, an, I'm sorry, a GI guy. We couldn't seem to get an appointment with a GI guy in that, la, late of, that little of notice over Christmas. But she, a friend of ours pulled some strings with a friend of hers and got us into this amazing man. And so we see him, we describe what's going on, and he orders that day an endoscopy to look at what's going on in Brad's stomach and stuff. And I'll never forget that afternoon, they admitted him and they admitted us to the cancer ward, which I knew was a bad sign. And they said, it's one of five things. And they mentioned cancer twice. So the next morning, the, the doctor we'd met, the GI doctor comes into the room and says, I'm so sorry, Brad, you have terminal cancer. He didn't use the word terminal, but he said, you have duodenal cancer. It's in this section. It's going to take this major surgery. You can no longer eat. It's closed off your, the, 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 between the stomach and the intestines. It's now been basically nearly closed. And that's why you're, you're getting so sick. We're going to immediately, immediately schedule surgery for you. Um, but I want to let you know, I'm sorry. And I remember after the doctor left the room, I went up to Brad and I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, I'm not going to make it. And I just remember thinking, I don't know what to say to somebody who's just received the worst news of his life. And sure enough, we found out it was stage 3B and um, the surgery failed. And by the time he recovered from surgery, he could start chemotherapy. It was already metastasized throughout his entire body. And it was in his liver, might have even been in his brain. He ended up having early Alzheimer's. So my life imploded. I stopped working. That's when I retired. And I started taking care of him full time. And I watched this big, strong man in five and a half months go from incredibly out golfing, busy, going to the gym every day to death in five and a half months. And then, of course, we have kids who are rage from age of 22 to 17 and how do you prepare your sons to say goodbye for their father for forever? I just felt overwhelmed. And on top of it, Brad developed early dementia. And he, so he's losing his cognitive abilities, losing the ability to add. And eventually near the end of his life, he lost the ability to speak and lost the ability to write. It was devastating. We had to stop the building project. Um, and it just everything, everything was imploding on me. I, you know, my future, my, 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 my marriage was going to be gone. My last child was leaving the home and I had just kind of closed my practice and I didn't feel in the shape to see people. 
And then this person I had spent my entire life with that I dearly loved was leaving me. I felt broken, really broken. So when he passed away, I was shattered. You know, I felt like life had put me in a drift. I didn't fit socially anymore. I felt like the fifth wheel everywhere I went. I no longer could do things as a couple, you know. People felt sorry for me. And that was the other thing that was super hard was everybody saw me as part of Brad and Carrie. And now I'm just Carrie. And and they don't really know me that way. And, you know, I it just, it felt so weird, so awkward, so public. So And so I wanted, I really wanted the life that I had back. I wanted to get into a relationship with somebody and really recover this 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 thing that I had, this amazing thing that I had. And I would say Brad and my marriage was good. I wouldn't say it was perfect. There were times that I struggled liking him. You know, we, you know, get, but we worked things through. And, and the thing about Brad is that he really had my back. And he was super, super loyal. He was the kind of guy that you, you could take his word to the bank. Um, if he said to you, I will help you move. And even if he got the flu and was vomiting his guts up, he would still show up and help you move. He was just somebody who, his word was his bond. You know, I remember when his cell, he got the cell phone first in our house because work gave him one. And I remember just never even feeling edgy about the cell phone. Just feeling like I knew where he was and I knew what he was up to and I knew who he was with. He was just one of those people that what you saw was what you got. So I super, super trusted him. And he made me feel really safe. You know, he, he and I shared everything. We dreamed our life together. We, he put me through school and then saw me build my practice. He'd encouraged me to start writing. And, you know, he just was one of these people that sort of championed me. And so whenever we made plans, we made them openly and, and together we had a joint financial account. And, you know, we, we even structured how we spent money. So there wasn't any surprises. It was just a really trusting relationship. And rightly or wrongly, I just thought that's what relationships look like. I thought that that's what people wanted when they went into a relationship. They wanted that kind of vulnerability and intimacy. So when I got out and, and you know, when I ended up being widowed, I just felt really tossed out, really bereft, and but hopeful that maybe I could find that kind of love again. That I, I believe that that kind of that kind of person existed, that I could find somebody who really wanted to share my life and share, make plans and, and be financially, you know, share our life financially together. So here's the other piece though. Brad and I had had a life, a large life insurance that actually I was the one that took it out on him and took one out on me because I knew that, you know, it would be expensive if I got caught without a partner raising kids and with a mortgage that I had. And the other thing is his work left him a really good retirement or, you know, after, you know, retirement or death penalty, death, death benefits. So he left, so he left me financially independent. And that was strange. It felt really weird to go from worried about how many shoes I had and if I could afford clothes and, you know, how to manage Christmas budget to suddenly not have to think about those things. Now, it wasn't like I could go do whatever I wanted. I couldn't spend money like that, but it left me at least comfortable. But the feeling of that shift was weird, was really strange to go from, from very thoughtful to now being a little more not so careful. And so it was set awkwardly with me. I didn't really know I just felt really strange. I, so there was another error is I just didn't understand how to handle this change in my financial status. But that's a little bit of background. I think the one other thing to understand about me is I'm autistic. So I'm always, I'm not always good seeing duplicity and deception. Sometimes I, I tend to be a little too literal and I tend to, I don't like deception. I, I'm not good at it. I can't do it. It actually physically hurts me. I, I kind of assumed that that was true for everybody. And I didn't know that it, it wasn't until I found out that it wasn't. So there's some background to me and my life leading up to meeting Caesar. It's part four of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. As you know, I've already had my first date and I couldn't wait for my second. Everything about Caesar seemed amazing. He would send me good morning texts, wake me up, and then he'd be the last person to text me with sweet dreams. 
he would send me Bible verses. Uh, he would, you know, share songs that he thought of that he thought I might like. He, often these accompanied gorgeous images that he would send in these texts. He'd sometimes send me a little video of himself wishing me good morning or wishing me good night or telling me he couldn't wait to see me at the next date. And I was super excited. I couldn't wait to see him. Now, I came from a very sheltered background. I grew up in a conservative Christian home. And I was one of these, I was the oldest of three girls. I was one of these people who just did everything right. I was super careful and very cautious. Um, I, I had found really early that it made life better when I showed up in a way that, that was pleasing and helpful. It made my parents' tempers go down. Uh, it, it made my teachers like me. So I tended to be referred to as the teacher pet or goodies two cho- or goody two shoes or something like that because I was just one of these kids that just didn't cross the line. I always wanted to know what the rules were and I stayed on the right side of it. But losing Brad devastated me. I felt like God betrayed me, that I had been basically a good mom and wife and I had worked hard all these years and I suffered as a little kid because of the the abuse that I went through, the essay that I went through, that I, I really thought that I had had enough suffering in my life. And I felt kind of owed, honestly. I felt kind of like, I know now that that's not how I feel today, but I kind of felt God owed me. And as a result, I was sort of, I was angry. I was very, very angry at God. I, I, I felt like um, he took something terribly good, he derailed my life and exploded it. Now, cancer did that. I don't think God did that, but, but I, was, I was pointing a lot of blame at God. And so one of the things I decided, because um, Brad and my relationship was close on a lot of levels, but one of the nice levels was our physical intimacy. And we had a, a, a rich private life that way, and I felt really gypped because when he, when he got ill, it just suddenly was gone. I mean, it was like literally overnight from a normal life to suddenly everything was different. So I went into this relationship with a perspective of, I'm going to try a new way. I had not really ever dated before. I didn't know anything about online dating. I didn't really, outside of Brad, I'd never never had a serious relationship with another man. But I, I, so I felt like I I just wanted to expand that and, and that maybe, in a way, I guess I kind of blamed my conservative upbringing for some of the ways in which my life turned out the way that it did. So as I was getting ready for that second date with Caesar, I, I'd known that we'd already had crossed over based on his pushing. And so I'm thinking, okay, whatever. But here's the other thing that was going on behind the scene that I hadn't really processed a lot or did a lot with, that would, but it was a really big deal is that, and you probably know because you see it, is I wear wigs. Uh, when I was pregnant with my third child, all the pregnancies for me, I had three pregnancies, never went well. I had, I had some underlying like cardiac or heart issue that caused me to have extremely high blood pressure. And with the last baby, not only that, but my heart raced. You know, at night, my sleeping heart rate was 120. And they had me on medicine and they induced me and made me, had me go early. And, um, and one of the consequences of that just difficult pregnancy was I had a massive hair loss. So here I am in my 30s having this massive shed, permanent hair loss, and I'm devastated. So I, for several, many years, I pr- tried to figure out what I'm going to do to cover up this loss and feeling just uh, so ashamed, so broken. In fact, Brad never saw me naturally. I never showed him what I look like without some kind of a hair piece or some kind of a cover up or something. So here I'm going to have the second date with somebody and we're going to plan to share a hotel room and how do you hide that? So I decide to text him as we're getting closer to the date that I wear a wig and that I would probably be wearing a nightcap. And he texts back and says, I'm tired. I don't think I can do a relationship where there's not vulnerability and honesty and trust. So if you can't show me what you really look like, if you have to wear a cap at night, I just don't want to go forward. And that, mind you, this is like the day before we see each other. I'm shocked and devastated. I'm not ready to let someone into that kind of private part of my life. And yet, on another level, I was so touched that he was vulnerable and shared so much of that that it felt really like like mature and special. So I decide that I'm going to do the brave thing and do that. So I arrive for the second day. I'm now in his hometown in the Minnesota area. And um, he meets me as I get off the airplane with 
hot house roses, you know, not not the grocery kind, but really high end roses. This gorgeous. He looks so excited. And uh, we and and when he brings me back to the hotel, he starts to dance with me in the hotel room, singing in my ear. And I then take my wig off and show him. And it kind of moves into something that's really intimate. yet strange. It's was beautiful but weird I, I, know, I mean there's a part of the intimacy with him that always felt performative and not really close but I'm overlooking that because I'm just so touched with all the romantic pieces of this that it just feels really wonderful we have a great weekend um, he takes me to do some really unusual things we go to an aquarium we see some sights he takes me to his favorite restaurant and it's just a really cool experience being introduced to his hometown and I'm looking forward to our final day because I sent him the itinerary of my flights before I arrived so he'd know that I was going to leave like early afternoon. So we, I thought we still had the morning and the final day on Sunday. We could go get a brunch, kind of make it a lazy morning, wrap up our a slow goodbye. And I hear him getting dressed and, and kind of in a weird way in the bathroom. And he comes out and he's wearing football costume and you know football color beads and all of this he's dressed up like a like a like a fan and he says i'm meeting my son at a football game at a at a sporting event you don't mind if i drop you off the airport early and and um you know do you, and i'm thinking what so i'm going to go to the airport now and be there for like 5 6 7 hours so that you can go to a sporting event that you never bothered to tell me and i shared this itinerary with you and you didn't say it had a conflict and you, we didn't talk about what we're going to do Sunday. But I say to myself in my head, see, that's what you get for not being clear with him. So in the future, communicate clear, and then there won't be this mix-ups. So I pull it together, although I'm pretty crushed, pack up, and um, head out. We head out to the airport, and he to get ready to drop me off. And then he hands me these the roses that he had bought, only he'd clipped them. And he put them in a baggie and he said, here you go for the, here's the roses so you can take them home and dry them and have a memory of our first date. And my heart melted. So I felt like that horrible piece of him dropping me off early was suddenly washed away with this incredibly romantic gesture. So the date wraps up and I'm feeling like over the moon. I, even though I'd only maybe known this man for a month, I'm feeling incredibly in, in love with him and I even at that date tell him that I love him and he ends the date being me he ends the date leaning forward near my ear and he says he loves me too so I just feel like I have met this incredible person this romantic handsome um, professional person who is similar faith uh, wants the same kind of things and it's just this just really an amazing experience and so I leave that and go home and and it was shortly after that I find out that he's getting ready to go on a family trip to see uh, a, go to a family wedding actually maybe with his mother and he's going to be out of town for a few days and that we're going to have an like a gap an absence so I'm I'm dreading that thinking you know am I really I, I feel so connected and I'm really falling this for this person and I want to see him every day in fact to, to me Life feels like it becomes colorful when I'm around him and that when I'm away from him, it feels dull and flat and gray that I feel like I come alive when I'm with him and that I go into hibernation while I wait to see him again. And I'm realizing I really hate this long distance thing, that it's going to be a really big problem. So I gear up for him being gone. And as uh, the night before he leaves out of town and he's getting ready for this family wedding, he says to me, will you go study? And I'm just so touched again by this kind of old fashioned way that he approaches this. And I'm thinking, yeah, of course, of course I want that. And so that's where I'm gonna end part four. This is how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger, part five. He goes on that trip and he pretty much goes incommunicado. I don't hear from him, and it, which is really strange. It's like, like nothing, it w went dead. Except that near the end of that trip, he sends me a couple photos of himself at the wedding dressed up in a tux and he's you know one of them he's holding up a drink and he has a party hat on and and his eyes are wild it looks really like like frantic or a bizarre kind of i don't even know how to explain it just sort of manic almost but i'm relieved when he gets home because communication starts back up but it's weird texting with him was never 
good. It was, it was always strange. It was always on his terms. I would literally keep my phone next to me in case a text came in because if I texted him, it might take hours or maybe a, a day before he'd respond. And then there'd be a flurry of texts would come in, and I almost felt like I was trying to catch him and grab him and hold him on to him. And then next thing I know, he'd be back on again. And it felt really, which made seeing him, wanting to see him even more intense. So I was super looking forward to our next date, which we planned to have in Chicago. And I lived outside of Chicago. I, in fact, I went to college near there. And so I and not knew the town, but it wasn't new to me. But I was super excited to go with him and, and make a really great experience out of it. In fact, it was my last big trip. Yeah, it was my second to my last. It was my last big trip with Brad before he got sick. It was the last that thing we did was in Chicago. And so there was a part of me that even wanted to make new memories that are happier because that trip was kind of tense and we had an argument. It wasn't really great. And, you know, it was one of our, like I said, last trips before while he was healthy, with, while Brad was healthy. So I really wanted to make new memories with Caesar and do something different. It was a fantastic event. We went to all the popular Chicago sites and took photos and ate at great, great restaurants and just had a wonderful time. And it felt mat like I, like, like I felt like Cinderella. I felt like I had woke up into this incredible experience, had the best that I'd ever had, everything that I ever wanted in a relationship I felt like I was finding with him. But yet there was something about him and the way that we were relating that just didn't add up, like his, not, his lack of availability and how we didn't talk on the phone much. He just wasn't really available. And I kind of chalked it down to work or chalked it down to him having a busy life. Or maybe I knew he had an adult son that he supposedly lived with, and I thought, well, maybe... They're spending time together. Maybe they have a rich life together. And so I kept thinking that it was sort of me. I needed to grow up and be bigger about it and see this as just like what relationships look like. I didn't know how else to interpret it. And I didn't know that this might be a big red flag that I was missing. But I was feeling edgy enough that I decided to contact a private eye, a back, somebody do a background check on him. I not just one of those online things. I wanted to actually have someone like look into his records, look into his legal records, financial records to the degree you could that was online. And but I had a specific question because remember he'd been married four times. I wanted to know if he was divorced. I wanted to know if he was really not living with someone and he was actually divorced. I don't know why I had that concern because I would had I had gone online and I could find proof that he had been married several times. I mean, I could find those records, but I couldn't find the records to prove that he had been divorced. And I just, it, I had this uneasiness about it. So I called up this guy I'd used before when I was being scammed by somebody and I wanted somebody to look into whether or not this person was real and that person wasn't real. But so I called this guy back up and said, would you do a, a check on Caesar and see what you could find? And when, what came back was hopeful but also surprising it, it came back the guy said the the pi said the best that i can tell he's living alone his utility suggests it's only one person living there i really couldn't do find his divorce decree so i can't tell you he's for sure he's divorced but i can tell you he's living alone and then it also came back that he had had a lot of job changes like many in in pretty short pretty quick and that he had uh he'd filed for bankruptcy a few times it also showed that he'd had a DUI as well, and that he'd a cup and a come driving incidents that were problematic. So here I'm sitting on this information. We're getting ready for another day after Chicago. He's going to come to my house, and I'm not for sure what to do with it. I feel like I betrayed him. I feel like if I had those concerns, I should have gone to him and asked him about it. But I didn't feel a freedom, and I don't know what made me feel so silent, so scared to speak up and ask more about his history. Except that, you know, I remember during that first date when I asked him about his use of pornography, he just said no. I mean, it was just a flat no. So I realized there was off limits with him, and now I'm dancing around some stuff, and this was my way of solving it was to, to pull this background check. So he comes. Again, we have a good weekend. He has issues with his phone, and he asks if I can help it because I'm kind of techie. And I do end up figuring it out. I, I, I have to reload his phone uh, and sort of do a reset, use my, my computer to back it up, reset it, and then it corrected the phone. And so I gave it to him, and I remember him looking at me really strange and saying, so what did you have to do to fix this? And I explained the process, and he like just looked at me. And then he said, oh, okay, thank you. And I just thought that was weird. Like, you should be grateful I fixed your phone, that you don't have to go to a service center to get it fixed. But 
So, but in the middle of all this, I feel this weight. I have to tell him that I did this background check because I really don't want secrets between us. This feels like a big thing. It feels like an act of distrust. And so I, I wait till, you know, shortly before he's ready to leave and say, hey, I want you to let you know I did a background check. He goes absolutely still. Just still. And then he says, with low voice, it almost sounds menacing, so what did you learn? And I said, well, it showed that uh, you lived in a lot of different places. And he goes, no, I didn't. My identity had gotten stolen. I have proof of that. I have, I have police records, and somebody else is using my Social Security card. I've never been in these other states. Oh, okay. Well, it showed that you had had some bankruptcy. He goes, yeah, I told you about that. I've had ran into some mental health issues, and, and during those periods of time, I lost employment, and, and I w had some dis bankruptcy. Okay, yeah, he had mentioned it in passing, but I didn't really check into that. And I said, well, it also showed that you changed jobs. He goes, yeah, I changed jobs, you know, okay. And I said, and, um, and it, that you've had a DUI. And he said, yep, I drove drunk and got in trouble, and that was really expensive, but I worked it through, and, and I'm able to, I have my license black. And he's absolutely still, like, I can almost feel like fury is rolling off of him. And I'm feel I now feel like I'm I'm a five year old, you know, reporting to my parents. And tears are dripping into my lap, and he gets up and he walks behind me, and I think it's over. I mean, he just feels like I did this ultimate betrayal, and he he calls me over next to him on the couch, and he says, "Listen, next time you have concerns, talk to me. Don't do it like this." And I just start to cry, and he pulls me into his chest, and I can feel his heart beating and the warmth of his body, and he said. Listen, it's going to be okay. Just next time, talk to me. And I just melt. I feel like he gets me. This is incredible. We have this big thing, and, and it was a hard thing, and I did something that was harmful and hurtful, and he he's understands. He's he's worked, made a way through this, and I just feel really, really great. And yet, there's a part of me that still doesn't because it feels like still I have questions, but I don't even know what the questions are that I should have. I just feel like something's, I don't know, like not quite adding up and it, it was leaving me uncomfortable. But here is the other thing that was leaving me super uncomfortable was I hadn't shared with him the fact that I had come into money and why I was not working and, and why I was had all this downtime. And I could tell he found my lifestyle really odd. And he was kind of starting to make comments about, you know, asking what I did with my day and what kind of things did I accomplish. And I didn't have anything to say. I mean, how do you share, like, what TV shows you watched or you hung out with a friend? I mean, how do you explain the fact that I don't have uh, a work history to share with him? You know, it's like, when are you going, are you counseling? Are you going to go back to practice? And like, no, and I'm writing. And I mean, I try to like make up a life that sounds like it's busy, but I can tell there's this weirdness and yet I'm starting to feel this incredible trust with this person. And I had had this, you know, I'm feeling defensive. I had had this, you know, incredible rich life with Brad that I had shared completely. So I'm feeling I want that again with Caesar. So I, on a phone call, I explained to him that I had come into money. And what's worse is that I told him the amount. And the phone goes absolutely silent. And when it did, I just felt this like wash of shame. Like I did something really bad, so bad that I, I know that it's not recoverable, but I'm going to end it here and tell you more in the next part. So this is part six of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. And so the last part I shared with you that he was starting, Caesar was starting to realize that I didn't, wasn't working full time and I did not explain how, my living situation. And I then told him, I told him that I had had money and not only that, I told him the exact amount. And when I did that, on that phone call, I felt such intense shame that I knew I had blown it, that I that I had ruined this relationship, that I had done the worst thing possible, and there would be no take backs. And I also knew that I now would never know why he was in this relationship with me because I had added something that was like this very enticing carrot. And that the best thing, the most safest thing that I could do was to break up with him. And I was so distraught that I literally forgot that I told him. I repressed it. This is not the first time I've had repressed memories. As I mentioned, I'm a survivor of SA and I was really young at the time. It was a horrific experience and I don't have all my memories back from that period. And, and I just survived this really kind of scary home. 
um, in which that it, I, I just learned to shut my emotions down. And sometimes I even I for, forgot things, forgot, forgot memories, forgot events that happened to me. And I literally forgot that I told him. It was as if it never happened. I, and and I, didn't, I didn't remember that I told him until two years after the relationship was over. And I was wrapping up writing of Love You More, my book, about this relationship when it came back to me. And I was like, oh. So that happens. But the distance is wearing on me. I, I just, life is horrible away from him. I want to see him more. So I do this really radical thing and decide to, to go to his area for a three-week extended period where that way I could see him every day. We could, like, more date more normally. And I thought that would be great. He thought it was a great plan, too. He said, normally I don't do this, but you being really far away and I'm falling for you, too, sure, let's do this. So we planned that we would meet up at the end of Thanksgiving holiday with family, and then we'd spend the three weeks uh, leading up towards Christmas, kind of like mid-December together. Now, in this process, he gets a new job, and a job that moves him to another state. And this new job puts him up in like one of these sweet hotels, you know, with a little kitchenette, like a burner or something. So he says, hey, we can't meet in my hometown anymore. We're gonna have to meet in this new area. It's in Iowa. It's where I have the new job. Are you okay? And it actually, I'd already had made a reservation. I was going to lose that reservation, three-week reservation. And he made no offer to pay for it either. But I just swallowed. And he goes, how about you just stay with me in this hotel? And that way it saves you the money. I know you already spent that money. That would be a way to sort of fix this. Thought, oh, okay. All right. Not real happy about that. I was really looking forward to the Airbnb. That, But I okay, we can shift. I really want to see him. So I arrive. And it's this dumpy place. It's dark it has like a like a lead pipe for a closet where you hang clothes on a uh, uh, it was spring ma spring mattress uh, i mean literally like a like the the base is just a spring thing it is it was awful and on top of it he's working 10 plus hours a day and i'm in this little and it's winter winter in iowa cold you know so i'm kind of stuck in this hotel waiting for him and I, I go ahead and I try to make the best. I make dinner and I contact friends and I bring some, th th you know, projects that I wanted to work on while I was there. So I work on the projects and watch TV, but it's really boring. And at night, he's he's tired. You can he's gray. He's got gray dark circles under his eyes. And in the middle of all this, there's a there's a fire at this new. He's working at like this factory and there's a, a fire. And he's a supervisor, so he ends up being the one that gets called a lot to help watch make sure this fire gets put out and he comes home smelling of smoke and he's coughing and it's just a mess. It's just not anything like what I thought. And he's, he's, he feels emotionally distant to me. So I somehow make it through the first week of, we're gonna have two weekends together and make it through the first week and we're looking for the weekend. And he comes home after work one night, uh, like Thursday night and says, hey, I heard from my son. He wants to see me back in my hometown three hours away. I'm gonna go see him for the weekend and then I'll be back on Sunday night. And I'm thinking, what? I'm here in this hotel. I'm only have two weekends and you're going to go leave me after I spent the whole week alone, mostly because you're working so hard and you're going to leave me to go see your son for the weekend. I, I was stunned. I was so angry. He was really angry. I was really angry. It was really, it got confrontational. You're not going to tell me I can't see my son, are you? So he finally, we, we, he kind of moves to another, he goes to the bathroom, cools off, takes a shower, comes back out and says, hey, I have a plan. How about you ride up with me? My son's not ready to meet you. I'm not going to introduce a girlfriend to him. But I didn't get to see him for Thanksgiving because he was out of town or somebody was out of town. And I really need to see him before the holidays. And I'm now living here. But how about you ride up with me, stay in a hotel there, and then we'll come back together and we'll at least have that time in the car. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not the perfect plan, but at least you're trying I was really thinking I in fact I had started to pack and I'd put my suitcase under the bed because I thought I, I'm not sticking around for this so we do it and it's a weird it's weird he leaves and he's gone till late he comes home he doesn't even change his clothes and doesn't brush his teeth and he goes to, and he's sick he has a cold so he's it's nothing romantic it's not a good weekend and I and I end up feeling like I should have gone home it was so like such a bust so I I limped through another week of him working a lot and then the last weekend, it, it, I find out that one of the Christmas gifts I had ordered for myself wasn't going to arrive, and I was really upset. And he said, are you going to let this ruin your weekend, or are you going to pull it together and do something? Well, 
we exchanged gifts, which I had a gift, but he took me out shopping and gave me a few, bought me a few things from a tech store. It was just lackluster. And as the whole trip wrapped up, I'm thinking, I'm not for sure we're going to, this is going to go anywhere. I'm not for sure we're going to make it. But, but I did learn something by doing this. I, I fig- realized that living in Michigan where I lived as part of Brad and Carrie for all those years wasn't working, that I was really depressed. So I called my son up who was living with me, my middle son of the three sons I have, and I said, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about moving. And, you know, Iowa is as good a place as anywhere else. I don't know where else to go. You know, at least it's sunny here. It's, it's cloudy in Michigan. And, and, and what do you think? Would you be interested in moving? And he said, yeah, I'm really depressed here too. It's too many reminders of dad. Let's, let's do this. So I use the last few days in Iowa to look for a home to move to with my son. And I'm not for sure if Caesar and I are going to make it, but I'm not for sure I care. But at least I have this new plan to head with my new life to kind of go in a new direction. And maybe I'm thinking if I'm in this area, Caesar and I can at least try to date and see if it gets a little more um, better footing and gets a little more normal. But I'm feeling excited about moving to somewhere new. So I find a house. I'm super excited. I go home. I have a decent Christmas. It's you know still hard because we can feel Brad not being there. As my sons don't even really know how to talk about missing their dad. And it just, like, Brad hangs over. This is the, the second Christmas without him. But Brad's lack of presence just hangs over us so heavy. But I'm feeling hopeful because I'm going to have this new start in a new state. And at least that maybe things will become a little bit more normal. And maybe there'll be new opportunities for my son who've been having a hard time finding a job. So I'm feeling some, like, optimism in the middle of all this hard stuff so we wake up in early january and in the middle of a snowstorm we moved to iowa and moved into a new house of uh, and and actually it was one of the, my favorite places to live and, and it was a gorgeous house and uh, my son found a great tech job um and and what surprised me the most was caesar was excited to see me and he met me and and met my son took us out to dinner and we started to he started to come over at night to watch TV with me before he went home and we started to have this nice dating relationship that felt really good and everything I had felt you know hopeful about all the romance and all that kind of re- it felt came back like he on Sunday he would take me out and we get all the stuff for carnitas and then we'd have carnitas with my son and we'd watch movies with my son and it just felt like really fantastic so then Hello, or then Valentine's Day is coming up and he says let you know and I have some tickets to airline tickets to use up and he says let's do something special and I'm thinking you know what I'd like to take you to where I got my degree you know take you out to Napa Valley in California and be really romantic and and uh, he can he can see tour some wineries with me and I can tell he's up to something special and, and I start to wonder if maybe he might ask me to marry him and that will be where I end part six this is part seven of how I met married and got scammed by a gold digger So my son and I move into our new house in Iowa and start to settle in, and I find it harder than I expect. I love the house. Cool neighborhood in the sense of it's cute, quaint. The way the town's laid out is good. My son finds a great job. That's awesome. But I'm not making friends the way that I thought. And I, I don't quite know what to do with myself. I'm in a new town. I'm not licensed to practice there. And on top of it, I've been thinking about moving to Mexico because my thought was, if I end up getting in this marriage, wouldn't it be cool to start a business together? I used to be a landlord in Michigan. What if we started a vacation rental business in Mexico? And that way we could have a company we ran together and we could be together. And I just had this idyllic picture of how I wanted life. And it's not happening in Iowa. But we get ready for the trip to California and he's going to see some of the sites of where I went to school and then we're going to go up to Napa Valley and I'm excited because I can tell he's got something in the works and I'm thinking maybe he might ask me to get engaged so he plans a special evening at a winery of one of his uh, uh, of, of a famous you know it's actually the Coppola's winery and he's a big fan of the Godfather and we go up that night and he's kind of antsy and excited and I'm excited and we're dressed up and it's really a great night. And he takes me out to the back deck and it's dark already and the sun is set. In fact, the moon's up and he looks at that moon and he talks about how gorgeous it is. And then I turn around to find him on one knee with a, a box held out and says, Carrie, will you marry me? And I'm stunned. 
and I look at the ring and then my heart fell because it was obviously very cheaply made. I could tell it was not even real metal. It was, had been, what's the word, you know, coated. And, um, but he's all excited and I don't want to break the moment. It's been so, such a great evening. So we go in and we have dinner and, but I'm kind of feeling weird because I'm excited we're getting engaged, but why did you buy such a cheap ring? I'm seriously, I mean, it looked like you got it out of the bubble, the bubble gum machine or something. But I, he looks, he sees my face just before we go have dinner and he sees how fallen, crestfallen it looks and he, he leans close and whispers and says, I know it's not much. It's all I had right now. I'll get you a much nicer one for one of our anniversaries. So I take that as a consolation prize. At least he knows and he's, you know, trying to make the best of it. So we, we have a great romantic weekend, see some great wineries. We even do a mud bath and, and laugh and take some pictures while we're doing this kind of crazy experience. And, and then we head back to life again. And I, I keep seeing him. He invites me up to have lunch during his work days. He's working long. He's looking really tired. But I'm excited because now we have a wedding to plan and a honeymoon to plan and, and a future. You know, we, we're talking about live, moving to Mexico. And I started thinking about, you know, where if I moved to Mexico, where would I want to live and, and what property might I want to buy? So we even fly down and look at something together. We're just kind of like making these big plans together. And I'm very excited about all of this. So we uh, we in fact, we find a property in Playa del Carmen and I go down and look at it with him and we both really fall for it. We really like it a lot. And in that flight, in that process, we also then fly over to his family that lives in near Mexico City and we meet them. And they have this engagement party for us too with the family and celebrate our, our coming together. And uh, it's really cool. In fact, on the way over, he's when we're flying there, he holds my hand and looks at me and he says, I've never taken anybody to see my family before. This is the first time I'm so excited about doing this. And I've never taken a woman before we got married to meet them for their their kind of their permission. And you know how cool is this? And I'm feeling so so excited and so touched and like everything's just coming together, you know. So we end up putting a deposit down on the well. Actually, I did because he doesn't he though he was working a professional job. He didn't seem to have any savings and he had some loans and some debt. So. I'm the one that put down the deposit on the property and I'm, you know, moving forward with the attorney starting to build, you know, create a company that's going to own several properties to have a vacation rental business in Playa del Carmen. And uh, so we're all excited about all these things moving and the wedding coming up and we, you know, plan this white, like with hydrangeas and a chocolate cake and having just a few close friends and family come in and really make it a special event. One of my friends from back in Michigan is going to come and officiate. And he's gonna. We we'd even decided we're gonna write our own vows, and so it's really cool coming all of this to come in together. And and I'm I'm getting excited about moving to Mexico and getting my visa and becoming a you know resident there and and starting this new life with him. Something that actually, believe it or not, before Brad passed away, we talked about this that how I could do that that I could live abroad and have this really cool experience because he'd known I traveled when I was a teenager and a young adult that he said, you know, you should do that. You should consider doing that and start a new life in a new country and kind of dream that together just before he passed away. So I'm feeling like I'm fulfilling Brad's dream and on top of it, starting this really cool thing with, with Caesar. I'm wrapping up details, wrapping, he's, he's wrapping details up. We're approaching the wedding. We, did, we realized because of the visa, we really need to get married sooner than we had planned with family. So we decide we're going to have a courthouse wedding, you know, get legally married, and then marry again with our family. So we're coming up to that date in May, and uh, I rush home back to Michigan to kind of wrap up some business there. And I fly in, you know, and we're going to get married in five days. And I see him, Caesar meets me at the airport, not my son. I planned to be meeting my son, but Caesar meets me and he looks awful. He's rocking back and forth and he's sweating and he has roses in his hands. So I go up and I think, oh my goodness, which of my kids got hurt? I go up to him and said, what's wrong? And he says, I don't know how I don't, didn't know this. I don't know how I forgot, but Carrie, I'm still married. I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, I, I, that last marriage was so awful that I just walked out and I just literally forgot that I'm, I never bothered to get a divorce from her. I'm still married. And this weekend I rushed back to my hometown and I filed a 
divorce. And I'm able to do it because her and I don't have any property and no bank accounts. So I'm able to do a real quick one, but I'm technically married for another month. I can't, we can't get married in five days. And then he looks at me and he says, are you gonna leave me? And he starts to cry. I'm sick. The very thing I had worried about that I'd asked the private investigator to check into was to find out if this guy married. And he, and he has been. I've been sleeping with a married man. I don't even know what to say. And on top of it, we need to get this visa wrapped up. We have an interview with a consulate and it depend, part of my qualification is depending on me being married, having a marriage certificate. So that makes everything that our timeline crunches tight, you know, if we're gonna move and do all this and because some of the move parts have, has to be done on a deadline. I say to him, I'm not, we're not living together then for the next month. I, I, you know, we're, I don't want, we, I, I need, I need to respect this other woman, even though I didn't, I didn't know. And this is disgusting to me He goes, I get it. And then we get really quiet. And so I just kind of put my head down for the next few weeks. It takes, it's going to take four weeks and, and focus on the wedding and focus on thinking about making this move and actually, you know, doing it, even though I just barely got to Iowa, I'm already like moving again. I, we do all of that and I'm, and I feel like I'm running. I feel like I'm, something's wrong and I'm running and I don't know what's wrong. And I just feel like ever since Brad died, my life had gone wrong and I just feel like I can't get it back and I can't stop running, but I'm doing this anyway. And one afternoon, Caesar called me and said, hey, let's make a special weekend. When we pick up that divorce decree, let's celebrate the fact that we're officially divorced and we're now free to get married and we're, you know, everything moves ahead. Let's make it an event. I think that's cool. So we planned to do a Segway tour of his hometown after we get picked up the divorce papers from the court and I, we, we make a reservation at one of my favorite, my hotels and we're, I'm excited thinking we're going to make this a great event things are going to fi get fixed and we're going to move ahead and that's where i'm going to close part seven this is part eight how i met married and got scammed by a gold digger so we're waiting for that month's period to end so we can get a divorce so he he can get a divorce so that we can get married and i'm just counting down the days i feel so ashamed i don't tell anybody I don't even know what to say. I just feel I don't want to be that woman. And that's how I'm feeling, like that woman. And, and I'm mortified, like mortified. I just want to get this behind me. So the day finally arrives. We drive up to his hometown. We check into the hotel and we pick up the divorce decree. And he comes out of the, court, heart, the courthouse with me after picking it up from the clerk and literally does a little dance at the courtyard with me and so excited, like, we can finally get married. And I'm thinking, oh great, and we're gonna have a celebration and we're gonna rekindle our relationship and, and, and we're only now days away from getting married now again. We have a new court date with the court, uh, courthouse at the, you know, we're gonna get married to clerks in a few days and I'm so excited and I think we're gonna go out somewhere really cool. And as we're driving back to the hotel, he says to me, hey, my son got a hold of me and he wants to see me tonight after work and he works really late and um, I'm here in town and I thought I, and I hate to say no to him so I've made plans I'm gonna leave tonight and I'll, I'll be back late and I'm 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 like staring at him I don't even know what to say it, like you haven't talked to me when, and when did this phone call happen I never saw the phone ring and you pick it up how, how when did you make these plans See, we get back to the hotel and he's, let's go see a movie and get something to eat. Like that's gonna be our special dinner is we're gonna eat at the movie theater. So we do, and I don't even know what to say. I'm beyond words, crushed. And he heads out at 10 p.m. that night. And I think, okay, we're gonna do the Segway tour tomorrow morning, it's early. Like we gotta be there by not before nine. He's gonna be back and we're gonna, you know, because we get early and he doesn't. It's then 1 a.m and then 2 a.m. And then I start to think, well, maybe he's in the hospital, you know? So I start to wonder what hospital should I start to call or do I call the police department first? And then it's 3 a.m. And it never occurs to me to call him because he just doesn't pick up the phone. He's not, he doesn't respond well if I communicate with him. So I'm kind of feeling like that's meaningless, but I go ahead and I try. And I, so I ring his phone and nobody answers. He just goes to voicemail. So I do it again thinking, well, that's really weird. And he picks up and I say, hey, it's really late. Are you okay? It's nearly three. I'm coming home in a half an hour. We're wrapping it up. You know, my son and I are wrapping it up. I'll be there in just shortly. Like, okay. So I 
wait up for him. And he comes in. He says, you won't believe it. He didn't tell me he had to work till 1 a.m. So I just and I so I just sat there and I'm thinking, so from 10 to 1, you sat at a restaurant and didn't even bother to call me. I could have come and meet you. you and you know, I didn't think of that. It just it just was waiting for for my son to for us to connect. So finally, when he was free to connect, you know, I wanted to make the most of it. I was floored. And and I'm thinking, you couldn't text me. You sat there for three hours and you couldn't text me. You couldn't invite me and you couldn't text me. It was just strange. But we now are going to get ready for the Segway. We have a fun time. It goes well. We go back and then we end up getting married at the courthouse. Uh, five days later, we we go in and we see the clerk and again it's just weird you know it's I, I'm dressed up and my one of my close friends from college comes and meets us and my son acts as a witness and she acts as a witness and but it's like you know it's just missing something it's feeling kind of a little odd but we're now officially married so we fly down to Mexico on on my on Caesar's suggestion for a honeymoon weekend and it, if it could go wrong it goes wrong it rains a lot um, our our Airbnb doesn't have internet. <laughs> it's just you know it's hot because it's June. You know it and it but and, and and it's not romantic. We don't really have much physical intimacy. And I'm thinking that's okay because we're going to get married with my family in a month, and we'll we'll make you know special reservations at the hotel, and then we have a really big honeymoon plan in Jamaica in August just before we move and by the way we're now settled that we had the consulate I had the consulate interview they've approved me I now I've got to get into the country the clock has started that I got to get in and finish the visa process so now things have to really start moving so I'm seeing all this getting laid out and I'm starting to feel like the time is you know moving fast and all this stuff has got to fall into place but I I, I just chalk it up that it's short weekend um, not things go wrong and that but I'll have a we'll have a redo the chance to do it re over do it over again so we get back from Mexico and we're heading into fourth of July weekend and he tells me he has to work he has a business trip and I'm thinking what you're leaving on a business trip over the fourth of July what company sends somebody to do a job in another location another plant on the fourth of July it but I and I'm I'm shocked but he heads out, and he heads out on Thursday, and he comes back on that Sunday, and doesn't say a whole lot about the trip. Doesn't, you know, it's just weird. But I'm now focusing on the family's event coming in for our wedding, and then we're get, getting ready to move and having the house ready for sale, and all of that, like I said, is coming. So we're now into August of 2016, um, and we have the family event, and it, it, it goes great, but again, the, the night after is weird. We, we have a special hotel and he acts like he doesn't care that we finally are married and we can feel this freedom to be together intimately. And he just, just acts like he turns me down. I had even had to bought a special negligee and everything and it was, again, it was just super weird. But again, I, I think he's working too hard. He looks really exhausted. We're getting ready to move. We got so much going. It's stress. This is just stress. So we start to get ready for the honeymoon which is like a month away and getting the house sold, which it starts to being shown. So all that stress. And then he loses his job. He comes home after we get one night day, you know, after the wedding and after my family's event. And he says, I, I don't have a job. They let me go today. And I, I'm thinking, what for? Why? And it just, nothing makes sense. And I, by the way, never saw a pay stub either. I know he had a job because of that fire way back in December when I had stayed with him. And I, I got to, you know, see that he was involved in all of that. And I picked him up at his work for lunches. And he was obviously working. But it just felt weird. But we get ready. And we get ready for the, the honeymoon. And the house is being shown. And, and we, we're we going to have to move. And we actually buy our tickets to leave the country officially. My son is finding another place to live. He's going to move out into his own apartment. And he's got this great job. And we decide we're leaving in mid-October. We're going to be moving to Mexico permanently as residents of, of Mexico in mid-October. So everything is moving towards that. So we've got this now this August honeymoon that we're finally going to take in Jamaica. And I'm super looking forward to it, to finally having a week alone with him. I mean, every time I've tried outside of those romantic weekends when we were dating, it just didn't work. You know, like we, except for the when we went to California and got engaged. But... 
but the dating was the best period and everything since then just felt hard and like I was missing like two or two boats passing each other and missing each other and I'm thinking finally we'll have a week or 10 days in Jamaica I can really get to know him we can settle down we can enjoy married life together and it's just going to be fantastic so we get ready to go we're both excited when we fly into Jamaica and to start the honeymoon and um and I'm going to stop here and, and go to part nine. So this is part nine of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. So we get ready for Jamaica. We fly in, and I'm feeling so relieved. I feel like finally we're going to have some time to ourselves, time to focus on us. At least slow down. He's no longer working, but work pressure is not on the both of us. We The house is now in the process of being sold, and we we the family stuff is out of the way we can finally just really enjoy married life and be together. So we get into Jamaica and uh, we, they show us around, take a tour, and we have a buffet that night. We go back in the room and I'm really excited thinking, finally we have some adult time. So he flops onto the bed while I go into the bathroom to change into something special that I bought for this occasion and I hear the sound of the TV turn on and I'm thinking, what? And I, my heart sinks, but I think this is recoverable. So I step out in my little negligee that I got for the occasion and I pose in front of the TV and he almost like cranes his neck to look around me. He says, do you mind just coming up and joining me? I really want to watch this. Like, okay, so I do. Feeling now overexposed and underdressed and stupid and cold in the air conditioning, but I do. I climb up next to him and and, and, and settle down and then suddenly, next thing I know, I'm waking up. I've fallen asleep, I dozed off. The TV's still on. I don't know how much time has passed. I can tell that Caesar's on the phone. He's doing something on his phone. So without letting him know that I'm awake, I look over at him and look over to see what's on the screen. And at first I can't quite make out what I see. I see flesh tone, but I don't quite get what I'm seeing. And then it hits me. He's watching pornography. And I watch him watch it. He's watching it. He's stopping, replaying stuff. And he'll even zoom in on a piece of the video. And I'm stunned. This is a person very well practiced. No embarrassment, no shame here. So while I'm watching this, a text message comes in. He flips over to the message screen and it's, I can see at the top that it's a woman. He texts or something. I can't see what he says. And then he goes, looks for a photo and he sends her a photo of himself. And then a few seconds later, a photo of her drops in. I'm stunned. He flips back to the pornography again and I can't stomach this. So I make this, make sounds like I'm waking up. He goes, oh, sweetie, you're awake. And he starts to then touch me intimately. Not really engaged himself. It's not like he's kissing me and holding me. It's just touching me. This just feels cheap. It feels awful. And I'm starting to back away from him, back away from him. And I said, you know what? Just, let's, I'm tired. Let's just go to bed tonight. Oh, okay, okay. And I don't even know how to bring up what I just saw. So we fall asleep that night and wake up the next morning. I'm still thinking, how do I bring this up? What do I say? So we have brunch and then we go to the pool and we're enjoying some drinks and kind of hanging out. And I finally work up the courage and I said, hey, I saw you watching pornography last night and texting a woman. You texting her to where you sent a photo of her yourself and she sent one back of her. I'm not okay with this. I thought that you didn't do, you weren't into pornography. I don't, I'm not okay with this. He gets angry, gets cold, and he swims away. And an hour he comes back and things are tense and we start to go get dressed for dinner. And we go and we have this dinner where it's just hardly we're talking to each other. It's our second night of the honeymoon and it's so, the tension's so thick. We get back to the room and he stands in the doorway and he goes, I'm going to go see the musical. I know you're not interested and I'll be back in a couple hours. And he turns around, he spins out and he walks back out the door. I'm just staring at the door as it closes, shocked, crushed. And I, it hits me. I know what this is. He's punishing me for confronting him for what he did last night, for that second, that first night. He comes back in two hours and he's changing in the bathroom and I haven't said anything. I don't know what to say. I don't know how things are between us, I'm trying to gauge his mood. And he calls out from the bathroom, hey, let's go to the pool. Are you open to that? I don't really want to do that. So I put on my wet swimsuit and we track off into the dark, into the pool. And we get there and we look up and the moon's out. And he says, see that? You remember when we got married? Remember that day? I'm sorry. You remember when we got engaged? You remember that day when we got engaged? And how the moon was out that time too? 
we shouldn't fight. I'm so sorry. And you know what? You're right. I shouldn't be texting other women and sending them pictures of myself. That's married people don't do that. So how about we put our phones away for the rest of this trip and just focus on ourselves. And I, it feels like music to our, my ears. I start to cry. He tells me how much he loves me. And we then, you know, it, it feels like things have moved better. So the next morning we wake up and we put our phones into the safe. And, and, and for the rest of the next few days, like the rest of that week, it's great. We have a good time. He, we do fun things together. We take a few tours. We meet another couple. And it just, it's not like super like physically romantic, but it's sweet. It feels fun. And it feels like what I had hoped for. So we finally get down to the last day. We have a great dinner. We kind of walk back arm in arm and, and wrapping up this really wonderful week together. He says, let's pack in the morning. We have some time. Again, it's not like really physically intimate, but it's still really sweet. And so we fall asleep that night and I wake up at like about 4 a.m. the next morning and to need to use the restroom. And I can see that there's someone has messaged me. A stranger has left me a Facebook message. So I finally am able to see the bright screen and read what actually this person says. And she writes to me. So the, no the joke's not just on me. It's on you, too. I've been dating Caesar for the last three months. And then she proceeds to describe my sunglass case that I leave in his car. She then says, hey, was that you the night? And she describes the night in May when we, he and I went to the courthouse to pick up his divorce decree. Was that you that called twice and he said he'd be home in a half an hour? He'd been with her. And I texted her for a couple seconds, verified a couple things, and suddenly it was like, there was two realities. There was the reality of what I thought was happening and what I knew and that, that this guy was going to work and he's coming home and, you know, he had a, he'd seen his kids and we're getting ready to move and, and I haven't even talked about starting a company, a Mexican company together. And then there was the reality of what actually happened and I realized I didn't know that reality at all. I realized I had married a stranger and it felt like those two snow globes, those two worlds, those two realities came together and crashed. And my reality, what I thought, who I thought I knew, who I thought I married, broke. And I realized I didn't know him. I'd married a stranger. And with that, my mind went blank, went like white, static, offline. I disappeared. Time stopped. And I don't know how long I was gone or checked out, but I heard the sound of my something chattering in the room. And I realized it was my, it was my teeth chattering. So I was shaking cold. I rushed to the bathroom and I just didn't vomit, but I just lost it in the other end, just lost it. And, and I, I don't know him, he's a stranger. So I go back and I wake him up and see Caesar, Caesar, somebody texted me. They said they know you. And he says, stop texting her, stop texting her. And I hit me, he knows her. He knows what I'm talking about. So I slip on my sandals and I tear off it to the beach and I'm circling around on the sand and I'm saying the Lord's prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I'm thinking I need guidance. I don't know what to do. My house is sold. My car is being sold. My son is moving out. I'm moving to a new country. I don't even know the language. I have a visa that I have to finish. I don't know how to get off this. I don't know how to get off this train. I don't know how to get off this ride. So I call a first friend. We never actually met him. And I, she, I said, tell her what happened. And he said, I told you he's a gold digger. I hang up thinking, this is not helpful. I need help. I need some advice. I call a second friend. And she said to me, I think he's get traumatized. Remember you told me about his terrible history he told you about on the first day? I've been sexually abused on the first date. I think he's I think he's got a sex addiction. Go talk to him. I, okay, I can get my arms around this. As a clinical psychologist, I can I that makes sense. Okay. So I step back into the hotel room and I look at him and he's just looking at me and he's like near tears and he said, You're gonna leave me? I just I, I just I, I wanted to know what it was like to have an affair and I'm so you know, I I know it was stupid. It was really stupid and, and I'd not done that before and and, and, you know, I think I have a sex addiction. I've tried to share it with one of my other wives before, and they didn't believe me. I just looked at it like we're running out of time. So we, I don't know quite for sure what to say. We pack, we meet the transfer, we head back to the back home. The ride's tense. I can already tell he's getting kind of copping an attitude. And we get home and we get into the, the house. I can see the light to my son's, under the son's door that it's on, and I know he's up, and I know I could talk to him, and I... I think, but if I do this, I'm going to drive a wedge between him and my new husband, and there's no going back there. They'll become enemies. 
I can't talk to him about this. I can't think of who to talk to about this. So that's where I'm going to end part nine. This is part 10 of how I met, married, and got scammed by a gold digger. So uh, we're back home after Jamaica. I'm devastated. I now know he's been cheating with this woman. And I don't know who to turn to. I'm feeling completely wiped out, I'm very much ashamed. I feel like if I talk to my family, they're going to want me to make a decision and leave. I can't tell my sons. How could my sons even be in the room with them? And yet I'm not willing to say that it's over. I don't know what to do. Meanwhile, we're moving out of our house. We're actually packing up. We've sold the house. The car is gone. So we end up moving into an Airbnb in Iowa for a month while we wait till we actually fly out of of the country and move to Mexico and that's still on and I, I don't know what to do because here's the part I, I forgot to explain is that we had set up a company you know as a we set up a Mexican corporation to hold properties so we could run a vacation rental business I had set it up with a with a law firm and, who didn't speak much English a big mistake but I, I didn't know it at the time and when they set up the corporation papers they asked what who would have what roles and nobody explained what it meant to be president or vice president what, what who who contributes how do you take all that in it you know into into consideration i asked them and they didn't really know how to explain they just said well these are the roles you need to assign somebody and then you need to see say what percentage of the company they own and again they didn't explain what that meant either they didn't explain about executive rights administrative rights about financial rights nothing no no conversation about who's even providing the capital or anything so i named myself president and i named him vice president and then i made this grave error because i don't understand any of the rules i make him 50% owner even though i provided 100% of the assets not understanding what I had done. Nobody had shared with me what that meant. And meanwhile, I also ran and saw an attorney in the United States about a prenuptial who said, oh, this is before we, by the way, all this happened just before we got married, who said, you know, the best that a prenup does is that protects your assets that you brought into the relationship. But, um, you know, as you get further into the relationship and you build a life together, then you, you share those assets together. So it really is essentially saying that I don't trust you until I know you better. And I'm thinking on the way home from that attorney's office, how is that going to help me? You know, should I do it or sh I don't know. So I had these really mixed feelings. I just felt like it was not this was one of those super naive moments. It just felt really cruel for me to make these financial decisions and not say I'm taking, I'm banking on us as a couple, as banking on us as a, as a going to make it and build this together that I want to show that I have faith and I have hope and I believe that this is going to go in good places. By the way, when we set up that Mexican corporation, one of the, the bylaws is that, um, is that any other country's rules have no standing that it is governed by the, the country of Mexico only. So having a prenup wouldn't have helped it save me on any of the money they invested in this company because it, it was now under the control and the rules of the country of Mexico. So And a prenup also didn't make sense at that level either. So fast forward, I'm, we're moving into this country. We have this corporation set up. We have a property that um, we also bought already a second property and a third property that was under construction that we need to take ownership in a few months. And we're trying to set all this business up long distance. We need to get there and do it. And I just, I don't know what to do. So I find a intensive program that treats sex addicts out in a Western United States, and I fly out in desperation for a three-day intensive, hoping that maybe they'll tell me what's going on. And I also schedule an appointment with a psychologist in the area who meets with us and gives him an assessment, who then says he needs residential long-term treatment. I'm thinking, what? I, as a psychologist, I knew exactly what she's meaning. She's meaning he needs to go into a program and stay there for months that his pro problem is so severe that it takes a lot of treatment and by the way there's no insurance for that this is not a dsm diagnosis sex addiction is not in the dsm-5 there's no insurance that's going to pay for this all of this is going to be out of pocket and i can see this t t hundreds of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars this is going to cost so i fly out to this intensive program which was not cheap for three days to find out the same thing that he has a pretty significant issue. I, I see these other devastated couples trying to make it, you know, trying to work through this. The guy meets me and asks me, what kind of woman am I? Do I know my own boundaries? Can I leave? And I'm thinking, 
You don't know what I'm in the middle of, that I'm in this big of this big move to a country where they don't have a language with a business that I'm relying on him. I have no property in the United States. I have nowhere to go. And you're asking me what kind of strong woman? I, I, I can feel like the doors, like the, I was entering a prison and the doors were shutting behind me. And plus, I still loved him. You know, I still at this point thought, okay, he slipped. I don't buy his reason. It's stupid. He wanted to see what an affair felt like. But, you know, I had invested in this relationship and my heart was still very much in it. So we leave the intensive program, go, go back to Iowa, and then we get ready literally to fly out. He gets roaring sick the day before we move. I mean, like vomiting um, horrifically because we go out to eat at a buffet and he eats something bad. But I pack us up and he somehow is able to pull it together enough and, and help me the next day load 10 suitcases. That's what we took. Everything that we we brought down in our life down to 10 suitcases and we moved to Mexico in middle of October 2016. And at first it felt like a big adventure. You know, we're closing on the new properties. We're moved into this new home with a penthouse. Uh, they overlook a little bit of, we get a little bit of the view of the ocean from the rooftop. We have these sweet moments where we're, we're furniture shopping for the new new places. We're getting things up online and wa watching the new construction. And, you know, we, we have some moments where, you know, he's we get down there and the first thing he does is he, he finds a men's group to be a part of. I find a women's group. Both of us are doing this online. And he's going through his phone and cleaning all, all the contacts he has. And that's in the middle of all this. I learned that it wasn't just her. He'd been sexting lots of women. And that there was another woman he had seen, I learned, during that wedding, family wedding, right after when he asked me to go study with him. He actually had met up with this woman, and they met at a resort nearby. They were in Playa. And then they went to the wedding together, and that the person probably who took the photo and sent it to me from him at the wedding at the end was her, which is why he, why he looks so bizarre is because he was dating me, saying so-called going study with me, and he's down there with another woman. By the way, I'm going to call her Maria because she plays pretty big in this story. So I learned Maria has existed, that he's known her for seven years. They've seen each other off and on. That she's been kind of one of her regulars for him, and, uh, and, and that they spent a week in September 2016 Oh, actually, yeah, 2016, they'd spent together. Now, by the way, we're in 2017. We're now married, and it's it's you know October of 2017. I don't know if I said the dates right. I may have mixed the dates up. But, yeah, I met him in July of 2016, got married in June in 2017, moved to Mexico in October of 2017. So I now know that Maria exists. I don't know what their relationship is at that stand at that standpoint in October of 2017. I, we now are in the country of Mexico. My residency is being firmed up, and things feel good. We're like opening business, getting our feet underneath of us, and I feel like, okay, he's working a program. I'm working a program. He went and checked out AA. He's even found a sponsor. It just feels like I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but I'm also shocked realizing that the intensive program had said to me, Carrie, you, you think you know what he's been doing? You don't. You only know the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more you don't know. But I feel like he's doing the right things and he's working the program and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. So we are getting ready to open a new condo and, and, uh, and we're going to, you know, setting them all up and it feels exciting and it feels like maybe we're on the right foot. And that's where I'm going to stop part 10. Now do you understand why the Managing Your Ship series is so important to teach us how to be careful about how we go into a relationship, how to pay attention to the signs in the beginning, how to have the right conversations in the beginning, how to pay attention to behaviors in the beginning, even greater than that, how to heal from one relationship, from one ship before jumping onto another. Because this is what we do, especially if we were in love, love. <laughs> I 
told y'all part, a little bit of my story, right? This is what we do when we've experienced love and we're so hungry to get it back. We're willing to forego all of the signs just to say we have someone, especially if it's someone that we feel like is out of our league. Then we're doing everything we can to protect it, like making excuses for it. You better know your worth and then add tax. When I get my Champagne Secrets merchandise, that's going to be on all of my mugs. (laughs) Know your worth and then add tax. Because it's too many broken individuals walking around. Because they didn't know their worth and they didn't value themselves. So they sought validation from a relationship. And when the relationship didn't work, they abandoned ship, jumped in the water, and fell for a rescue. Didn't we talk about that last night on the Managing Your Ship series? The waters can be a treacherous place when you're not healed. Think about it like this. If you cut your leg and jump off a cruise ship into shark-infested waters, what do you think is going to happen? The sharks are going to be drawn to that blood, right? Why do you not think it's the same in relationship? When you abandon one ship, Or in her case, she didn't abandon her ship. The love of her life was taken away from her through a terminal illness. But that's still an open wound. And she jumped into the sea bleeding. And she drew to herself a shark. Drop in the comments and let me know what you think about this story. We will be continuing part two on tomorrow, 10 p.m. Central. I know a lot of people are not getting their notifications. That's a YouTube thing because I'm not monetized yet. I'm hoping to be monetized by my birthday. I'm working hard towards it. My birthday is September 18th, Virgo style. (laughs) So I'm trying to be monetized by my birthday. We're about 20 watch hours away from being able to unlock our memberships. So I'm excited. (laughs) Because there's so much in store for this channel once we get monetized. So drop in the comments and let me know what you think. Consider hitting that like button if you enjoyed the video. Consider joining the Champagne Gang and the Fizz Fam. Hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show. And make sure you keep your notifications on so that you can be notified for our Wellness Waves Wednesdays where every Wednesday we pause to deal with our mental health. And this series that we have now is a crossover series. It's the X-Files Exposed meets Managing Your Ship for Wellness Waves Wednesdays. So come aboard. We're glad to have you. And if you're not sure just yet, don't worry about it. We'll leave the light on for you. Until next time, confidence. Always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta. In the hallowed halls of Hollywood's golden age, Where glamour met intrigue, there existed a tale shrouded in mystery. A tale that transcended the silver screen and delved deep into the heart of darkness. Tonight, we unveil the enigmatic odyssey of Natalie Wood. Born Natalia Nikolaevna Zakharenko on July 20th, 1938, In San Francisco, California, she was destined for greatness from the moment she drew her first breath. But amidst the glitz and glamour of Hollywood's golden age, darkness lurked in the shadows, waiting to consume her light. Natalie Wood captivated audiences with her ethereal beauty and undeniable talent gracing the silver screen with a presence that transcended the boundaries of time. But behind the facade of glamour lay a labyrinth of secrets, a world where fame and fortune mingled with treachery and betrayal. As her star ascended, so too did the whispers of tragedy. And on that fateful night of November 29th, 1981, aboard the luxurious yacht Splendor, Natalie Wood's life took a sinister turn. Amidst the opulence of the sea, secrets simmered like a cauldron of betrayal, 
Jealousies flared and hearts grew cold as the night descended into chaos. And when dawn broke, Natalie Woods was nowhere to be found, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and shattered dreams. But the truth, Shadow Hunters, remains elusive. A tantalizing enigma that begs to be unraveled. So grab a glass of champagne. Make sure your doors are secure. And enter the Noir Syndicate, where the truth is the elusive prize and justice the final destination. Join us on this journey into the heart of darkness for an episode that we call Natalie Wood Whispers in the Waves. This is Inky Noir Champagne Mysteries. See you soon.